We can also think about dispersion for sound. Sound is a pressure wave in the air, and we can think about, is it dispersive? So first, let's look at sound in the air. So I would like to derive the wave equation for you, but it would just take a long time, and we need to get to optics. So it's more complicated than the wave equation for the string, because you don't just use F equals ma, you also use the continuity equation, which basically is just the conservation of mass, the conservation of the gas. If the gas leaves here, it had to have gone over there. And you use the ideal gas law. And it's kind of messy and would take a while. So let me just give you the wave equation for air. And I'll explain the parts. So D2P, it's a pressure wave, dx2 equals um, rho naught over P naught times gamma C. I'll tell you what those are in a second. And then, of course, D2P, DT2. So a wave equation for the pressure in the air where uh, rho naught is the equilibrium uh, density of the air and P naught is the equilibrium pressure. And if you're just at normal one atmosphere, regular temperature, those are just some standard constants that you can put in. And gamma C is the known as the adiabatic constant. And it equals the specific heat of the gas at constant um, pressure over the specific heat at constant volume. I get upside down. And it's about 1.4. And it's just a constant that falls out from using ideal gas law and other properties of gases. So if you look at that wave equation, you know that the velocity uh, of the sound would be the square root of P naught gamma pressure naught gamma C over rho naught. Or if you use the ideal gas law, you could write it as um, the square root of the gamma C Boltzmann's constant times the temperature over the mass of the molecule. So this literally would be the mass of the molecule in kilograms. So if the air is mostly nitrogen, you'd put the mass of an N2 molecule. Um, so, and if we solve this for sort of typical conditions outside or inside, uh, it's about 330 meters per second. So pretty fast, but not the speed of light fast. It is also not dispersive. So if you look at these, these are pretty much constant. This is more or less constant, constant. Temperature is pretty much constant. The mass molecule is constant. So it's not highly dispersive. So we could write that we have a pretty good linear relationship between omega and k like that. So basically, omega equals this velocity times k is what that means in the air. And we know this is true from experience. Now let's think about what happens if we do sound in an object, so sound in a solid material. Well, sound is a vibration, and in the air we drive it, you know, properties of a gas. Here it's more just sort of a pressure wave in a material. It's a deformation of the material. And it's more complicated than our string, our vertical deformation of the string. It might be a longitudinal wave or transverse. Things can deform um, in a lot of ways. And often they come out with a dispersive wave equation, kind of like this one. So omega is V, and that's still the speed of the sound, but then it might be K squared R, okay? Where this, um, <coughs> is just some geometrical parameter to make the units work out. So exactly what R is depends on, on what object and what his geometry is and everything. But that's really no reason that's there. But the fact that this is squared means it's dispersive. Okay? And it's all complicated and different shapes will give you different forms and everything. But in general, you get something where omega V looks more like this, like that. 
I'm sorry, omega k. It's more like that. So it's dispersive because it's going like that in the omega versus k plot. And if you look at it, you can tell what this means is that higher frequencies are going faster. Right? So here, this is up at higher frequency. And, oh, sorry. And if you look at its omega over k, here I doubled k from this frequency to that frequency, and omega went up by more than double. So high frequencies move faster according to that dispersion curve. Um, so now we can decide if this is real, okay? What we can do is launch essentially a sound wave in a solid material just by hitting two solid objects. So let's a quick diagram of what I mean by that. Say we have a rod here, like this one, and I'm going to strike it at one end with a mallet. All right, so the mallet is going to hit it. And that's basically an impulsive force. It's going to create a sudden vibration, and the vibration you could think of as an impulse. And we know from our Fourier series it's hard to make an impulse. You've got to put a lot of Fourier components in an impulse. So what we see then is that moves down the, the rod. We can see what comes out by putting a microphone here. So I'll just draw an ear. That's supposed to be an ear. And it comes out. And we can see what happens to the impulse. Does it fall apart? Does it stay together? Or what? So I'm going to take this rod and I'm going to hold the end right up to my microphone. And I'll uh, just kind of strike it a few times. And you pretty much steer, still hear an impulse. So not much is happening to this impulsive sound. A snap is an impulse. A clap is an impulse. So not much is happening. And I mean, it's dispersive, but it's not so dispersive that the sound falls apart in just 30 centimeters. So you can also look at it um, over here. So here we have a chance for the sound to go through a lot more material. So this is a slinky, one of these steel slinky toys. And it's hanging here, clamped at the top, hanging all the way down and touching the floor. And we have a microphone sort of attached to it at the bottom. So when we create an impulse here, we can hear what sound makes its way all the way down to the bottom. And we can see if you go through this much thin material, if that's enough to make the dispersion uh, detectable. So I want to hear it as well uh, as you guys. And I'm going to hit it with this hammer to create the impulse. And we'll see what sound comes out at the bottom. So look. Wow, that sounds familiar. A sound from my youth, right, from 1977. Yes, of course, it's this. Right, that is the laser blaster sound. So first, let's realize that that does make perfect sense. So now we have the pulse going through a really long, thin piece of metal where the dispersion is stronger, and the fast frequencies move faster and the slow meet frequencies move slower. So the high frequencies that you hear get to the speaker first, and these get there later. So this sharp snap that's a sharp impulse here, like, like, like that, turns into pew, pew, the standard blaster sound. Right? And it sounds familiar because this is really the sound they used um, in the first Star Wars movie. So Ben Burt is this famous sound designer for movies and editor and everything. And you can find descriptions of how he had a hammer and would go to these long steel guy wires that hold up towers and just hit it and have a microphone on the tower and you get that exact sound. So if you watch the movie, you'll realize that's the exact sound. Last night, I watched the whole movie because I was trying to detect the reflections, right? So if you do that a few times, you can hear, you get the first sound, then it kind of bounces a little bit. And I thought, I wonder if I could find some of the reflections that they didn't take out. And I couldn't quite, but I want all you guys to help me. So get your old copy of Star Wars out Get your 77 VHS copy, and let's see if we can find a reflecting pulse in there that they accidentally left in. I doubt Ben Burt would leave one in, but maybe he did. The prequels, I haven't listened again, but I'm guessing they were completely computer synthesized sounds. I doubt they did anything as cool as hit a wire with, uh, with a hammer. And the new ones they're making, who knows? Uh, maybe, maybe they'll go back, get a hammer and a wire, make some real sounds, maybe they'll synthesize them. It's up to J.J. Abrams, I don't know. Who knows what he'll do? Another question you could ask is, is this dispersion because simply we're going through the metal and is the point of the slinky just to make the wire longer and it has a nice thin piece of metal where the dispersion might be higher? Or is there something about the shape and the structure of the slinky? 
So I'm not sure. I found one paper that decides pretty much everything they could detect was really just that it's the metal. But one way we could check it is to go with a bigger slinky. You know, whenever you're not sure what to do in an experiment, make it bigger. That's usually the best way to go. So let me see what I can come up with. So to see how the dispersion changes with length, I have a slinky here that I can make very long. Uh, let's see. And, uh, and let's see what it sounds like now. Let's see, hold it a little bit here. So you can hear that it's taking a lot longer. The pulse lasts a lot longer. That's because the slinky is so long that it has a lot of time to spread the pulse out more. There's also a weird initial sound that goes with the Not sure what that is. Um, but anyway, so making it longer did change the sound and change the sound in a way that makes sense. If this wave is going through a much longer medium, there's more time for the pulse to spread apart. It doesn't quite answer the question though, is it the inherent uh, structure of the metal uh, uh, wire and all the slinky does is give you a really long piece that doesn't have to touch anything or is there something about the slinky structure? And I think still it appears that it's just the metal because the slinky structure is basically the same. It's a bunch of coils, the same diameter. What we changed was the length. We changed the length of the metal, and that's what really seemed to change the sound. So the mystery of the dispersion of the slinky isn't completely solved, but it does sound really good.